First, I would like to call on one of our co-chairs, His Excellency Sultan bin Zayed al-Mansouri, to give his final address. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab. Well, this has been quite a very important gathering of the best of brains in the world, and we are very proud to have you here. Not only proud that you, make it to, you made it to our country, but we were very proud also to show off uh, some of what has been achieved in this country over the past 41 years. The evening last night, uh, I received a lot of compliment in it. And there's one word to be mentioned, and that is us as UAE, we very much share this success with you. Because without the ability of the contribution of so many different countries and people from these countries over the past 41 years, we would not have been able to achieve this. So I thank you for that, and I thank the people and the countries that have participated in this. The rest of my speech is going to be in Arabic, so those few who want to put their Earpiece. Uh, of course, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, al uh, Muasis, uh, was the president. Professor Klaus Schwab, the executive uh, uh, director of the uh, WEF, and uh, uh, Mr. Gamzi, uh, and uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is our greatest pleasure to welcome you in this final and closing session of the um, global. Uh, uh, Ag council uh, agendas, agenda councils. It is a very important event, and it is our honor to host it for the fifth con time consecutively, as it is stressing the fact that our country is becoming a very important uh, venue for international dialogue over the uh, uh, current issues and having the uh, uh, qualifications for success and the ability to host such uh, uh, global important events. Accordingly, the UAE is so keen under the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the President of the UAE, uh, may God uh, bless him and his uh, Vice President uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai, and uh, they have contributed to, to uh, enhance uh, the uh, spirit of international and global citizenship as well as dialogue uh, and contribute uh, positively to the international dialogue. And this uh, summit and its deliberations of the most important issues uh, over 88 councils and the participation of over 1,000 uh, leaders uh, f and experts uh, from the academia and the business sector who have exchanged uh, the best practices and expertise on dealing uh, issues uh, responsibility, uh, responsibly and uh, in a very qualitative manner. And there have been a disparity of uh, views and challenges and the issues uh, uh, in stake, but we have managed to succeed in having the public interest overcome our individualism. And we hope that would reflect positively on, on the international arena. And we would like to thank, uh, uh, on behalf of the UAE government, for those who contributed to the success of this event. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind uh, from the beginning of this uh, meeting to come up with a common and uh, a joint agenda and to come up with recommendations that would draw the objectives of our development and to provide for a more stable and secure uh, uh, international uh, community. We are all living in a global linked world and uh, changes uh, overcome borders, which requires us all to work responsibly uh, together more than any time before to come up with an agenda that is up to the development uh, objectives of the world and to focus on our uh, region. There are over th 350 million people living in the Middle East and North Africa. Rep uh, the youth represent uh, under 25 years old are 60 per uh, percent of the 
population, all of them aspire for services uh, of education, jobs, and housing, and to fulfill their objectives uh, falls in our uh, uh, development uh, uh, aspirations for the region. These aspirations and legitimate aspirations of the peoples have always been the most and top priority of our uh, sustainable development of the, in the UAE. We, in the last day of this uh, meeting and with the closing of our uh, uh, deliberations of this summit, I would like, on behalf of the UAE government, to thank uh, sincerely and appreciate all your efforts and contributions uh, that have been so positive to this important event. Uh, we are looking forward to see you again uh, in the future in our country, the UAE, and we look forward to your contributions and participation in other uh, events in the UAE that are uh, hosted in our country. Once again, I would like to thank you for your participation and wish you all the success and peace be upon all of you. Thank you. I now call on His Excellency Sami Al Gamzi, the Director General, Department of Economic Development of the Government of Dubai, uh, to give his final address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful, His Excellency Sultan Al Mansouri, Professor Klaus Schwab, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, allow me to express my heartfelt thanks to the organizers of the summit on the global agenda and the World Economic Forum for having chosen the UAE for the fifth time to host this international forum that reflects the success of the country in general and Dubai specifically in hosting this international platform gathering a number of intellectuals, experts, and decision makers who tackle the most important global issues and propose solutions in various disciplines, whether economic, political, social, environmental, and others. We are proud of the successful partnership we have with the World Economic Forum that was initiated in 2008, and we, f we are fully aware of the responsibility upon us to provide effective solutions to push the world towards a better state. This partnership over the years was uh, um, distinguished and led to an increase of the number of councils, up to 88 councils in participation of a large number of international experts. The Summit on the Global Agenda 2012 was not just distinguished by its size and the diversity of its topics, but also a number of parallel uh, events that was organized, like the forum uh, presided by uh, Mr. Girgash, Minister of Foreign Affairs, that was launched for the first time from the UAE. Indeed, in this forum, a number of leaders discussed with experts and decision makers in this forum. They discussed the challenges and joint risks. They also discussed the possibility of fostering international cooperation in the interest of the public at large. Also, on the margin of uh, the uh, summit, there were a number of discussion panels looking at the success story of Dubai and uh, sustainability in infrastructure projects, fostering innovation in SMEs, and uh, giving a number of other success stories. We were able also in the summit uh, to have open fora hosted by Zayed University in Dubai with the participation of a number of regional, local, and international expertise in order to give faculty and students the opportunity for an open discussions about uh, the uh, challenges facing the world today. Distinguished guests, 
we are all aware that your discussions uh, throughout the sessions of the summit have uh, fed into the recommendations that are submitted to decision makers in many of important global topics like financing, environmental change, uh, intellectual property, and many other social, economic, environmental, educational issues. We believe that the summit has given also a number of proposition, proposals and uh, recommendations that will pave the way to their submission during the annual uh, meeting in Davos next year. Indeed, the summit was an opportunity to exchange information and give uh, the best examples from the region and the world. In conclusion, I thank you for your participation in the summit, and we look forward to welcoming you once again in Dubai. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Such, it's a great sign of friendship, partnership. Yeah. <laughs> Your Excellencies, the time has come to thank you. First, I want to thank His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Vice President and Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates and ruler of Dubai. I want to thank the Government of the United Arab Emirates. And of course, special thanks to you, our co-chairs of this summit on the global agenda and the inaugural global meeting of regional organizations. You have been great hosts, and you deserve all our gratitude for making this meeting so productive and enjoyable. Let me just ask a question. Who was not very much impressed by the evening yesterday? <laughs> Your Excellencies, I do not see one hand up. I think this speaks for Dubai. It's a great place, the United Arab Emirates. And it's a place also with a great message, a forward-looking, positive, open world. I want to thank you, the members of the Global Agenda Councils. You have been formidably engaged in the work, and I know there are so many ideas and so many proposals which came out of the summit, and it puts a great responsibility on us at the World Economic Forum to make sure that those ideas find their way into the global decision-making process. I want to thank our partners and members, and of course all those who helped and who have contributed to make this summit a success. And here, I think a special appreciation goes to all those who take care of the Global Agenda Councils. We had over 200 people here from the World Economic Forum, but we should not forget the many, many people from our partners who were also working hand in hand with our own staff, representing a true partnership to make your life as easy as possible. Now, if I have to summarize the meeting, of course, it's impossible to summarize in five minutes everything which went on in the Global Agenda Councils. So let me make maybe a personal summary what I feel 
having been in many of the councils, how I would summarize the results. First, we define many issues, many problems, many challenges. But when we look at the world of tomorrow, and we take the forecast of uh, the IMF, the last forecast, despite all the negative outlook, the world economy will still grow at 3.8% next year. Now, if we assume in a pessimistic view that we have 10% growth, uh, I'm sorry, that we have 4% growth over the next 10, 15 years, we still would double global GDP output in 18 years. If we take a more optimistic view and we say the world economic as the world economy will grow at 5%, it actually grew at 5% over the last 10 years, then we would double GDP, global GDP, in the next 14 years. Just imagine, in 14 years, the world will produce double the wealth as it does today. And that's a positive message, because if we look at the unemployment problem, Today, three billion people are in the workforce, in the real economy and in the shadow economy, three billion people in the world. About, according to the last report of the World Bank, 600 million people will come into the labor market uh, in the next 15 years. So actually, with so continuing growth at a faster or lower pace, we should be able to solve many of the issues, such as job creation, such as eradication of poverty. But the problem is, and the challenge is, we have to make this growth inclusive. Inclusive on a national level, inclusive on an international level, because Without inclusiveness, our societies will break down. But it's not only inclusiveness what we need. We need also to prepare ourselves for the transformation because the global economy will look completely different in 15, 14 or 18 years, which means the restructuring process which we have to undertake, for example, in order to match the demand of talents with the delivery of talents, will be one of the key challenges we have to master. Let me take up another issue, which is the issue of global governance. Many discussions took place on this issue. And of course, we need to reform the existing formalized institutional structure in our world. But I think we should also think ahead. And in my opinion, shared what I heard in many of the councils, the future will be based much more on networks, on networks of common interest, networks of common purpose, networks of common action. And I think the structure which should evolve in our world is this combination of a formalized global governance structure, but very much helped by an informalized much more network, much more purpose-built, informal cooperation. And I think you have constituted a formidable network in this respect. A third comment which I would like to make is related to the multi-stakeholder concept. 
which of course has to do also with networking. The Forum is very proud to have been a pioneer of uh, the multi-stakeholder concept. But I'm coming out of this meeting even more convinced that the approach which we are taking, which we are taking is the right one. It's not the traditional approach to the multi-stakeholder concept. The traditional approach is based on the three pillars, governments, business, and civil society. But actually, we should integrate into the global tissue much more also four other pillars. One, is the voice of truth. If you want to solve the global issues, then we need the best minds, as Your Excellency said. We need the best minds, the best brains. We need academia. We need science. Because our world will be very much determined in the next 10, 15 years by technological revolutions. So we need you, and I think in this respect, you represent a new stakeholder group of global decision making, which is absolutely essential. But we have to integrate another movement, which is not only the voice of truth, but the voice of the good. And I'm happy and delighted to see the work which has gone on in the councils on ethical issues. Uh, I think many of the councils discussed morality. And this voice has to be integrated, because if we do not have a common moral value base for what we are doing, global cooperation will be unsustainable. But there is a third voice, which in addition to the traditional pillars we have to integrate. It's the voice of the young people. And I'm happy that we were able to create our hubs here of global shapers in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. If 50% of the world population are below 27 years old. And we have this youth bulge coming up. We need the young generation not only to integrate them, but as we have heard here from the podium, I think it was Dr. Anderson who said so, the young generation can teach us today how the modern world is looking like. But that's not enough to integrate truth, the good, the young. We have to integrate more the women, the female voice in what we are doing. I hear, I hear there is consensus with my statement. Now, that's the world how it is shaping up, and that's the role which uh, you have to play. Let me add, to conclude, one concern and one, or actually two proposals. The concern is when we look at this tremendous transformation process which is taking place in the world, in each transformation process, you have rupture points. The transformation may go in a very bad or maybe even catastrophic direction. It's a risk, the risks which accompany us. But listening to the councils over the last 48 hours, I think 2013 will be a very crucial year. 
a year with many of those rupture points. And I have been asked by some of the councils to use this platform and to appeal to the leadership, particularly in those countries which have a new which have new leaderships in place, or where the old leadership has been reconfirmed. To devote next year, a crucial year, a dangerous year, sufficient time and energy, positive energy, to look after our global issues and not just to be absorbed by internal problems, which of course also have to be addressed. So let's make 2013 a year of true global cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the question for us at the World Economic Forum is, so that's our responsibility, how can we make the work and the output of the Global Agenda Councils even more relevant. There were so many ideas. There was such a positive energy in the room. And here, I want to announce two proposals, and afterwards, my colleague, Will Martin Akmur, will ask you whether you have additional proposals. The first proposal relates to a global agenda platform. When we look what's happening in the world, many organizations, not only we here, are trying to find solutions for what's happening in the world. But there is little cooperation and sometimes even little knowledge about what is done among those institutions. So what we are working on is a digital global agenda platform where the key initiatives would be loaded on, initiatives of the multilateral organizations, initiatives of key foundations, and this platform would provide an opportunity for you on a continued, continued basis to interact and to give advice as far as the great initiatives um, undertaken by the manifold organizations in the world are concerned. Now, the second initiative, you all store such a lot of wisdom in your brains. And we want to make this wisdom available to you as a group, but to the world economic community in general, which means to the five to 10,000 top people in the world. And what we have in mind is to give everybody of you an opportunity once a year to express his concerns, his ideas, in a short video, which we will make available to our members and constituency. So just imagine in one year, since you are 1,000 Global Agenda Council leaders, we will have available for global decision makers access to the best minds we call this undertaking President Briefings because we have the metaphor. You are called into the Oval Office or into the State Council or into the Chancellery in Germany and you are asked to provide advice on the key issue you are a specialist on. What is the key issue? What are your recommendations? And to show you what we have in mind, we share with you 
one film, one video which we have produced. We have produced additional videos already here, and we will come back to each of you. So the video which you will see is Robin Niblett, uh, the director of the Chatham House, who is here in the room, and member of the Global Agenda Council on Europe. And we have chosen a, memo, a video on an issue which was so much discussed here in the room. It is the European crisis. And of course, I had a personal interest to choose also this uh, video because I just finished a small book on, on um, the crisis, which I will share with you uh, in the next week in an in a electronic form. So let's look at the video and keep in mind we will ask each of you to produce either with his uh, in-house resources, according to the template you will see, such a video, or we will help you to do so. The idea is that we together, we are not only assembled here, we are not only uh, interacting in our video conferences, but that our wisdom is stored and available to a larger circle of global decision makers. So after the video, my colleague um, Martina Kmür will take over. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lee Howell. I want to thank many people here in the room uh, who have worked so hard to make our life uh, easy. And I want to thank particularly again our guests. Please give them a great hand. Thank you. My name is Robin Niblett. I'm the director of Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. I'm here to give a briefing about Europe and in particular the momentous and historic steps being taken to create an economic as well as a monetary union after the global financial crisis. Never in the history of nation states have states sought to give up their sovereign control over such an important issue as their budgets, their economic governance, how they decide where they spend the bulk of their money. People think the European Union already is some sort of economic union. It's called the European Union. It was the economic community. But that really disguises the fact that Europe and the European Union remains a cluster of nation states. What's about to happen in the next five years or so will be a shift to where national parliaments and national governments will start to lose that almost ultimate definition of their sovereignty. And this is the, the fascinating thing about the experiment that's being undertaken, because each step that a governments take towards understanding what it means to build a fiscal, uh, banking and economic union around the currency, they're realizing that they're having to, to break apart what it means to be a nation state. But what's being talked about here is creating a backstop to a financial crisis, where if one country goes down on a financial crisis, other countries' taxpayer money will be brought in to cover that shortfall. Again, this does not exist right now, which is why we have the crisis we have. If you added up all the debt, put Greece in, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, you added them all together and had debt to GDP across all of the EU, it'd be smaller, all of the Eurozone, sorry, it would be smaller than the US debt to GDP. This phenomenon uh, carries huge implications for governments around the world. This is not about Europe looking at Europe. Other governments better be sure they're not caught unawares by the impact that this will have. If you're in the United States, uh, the fate of the EU economy, where you've got the bulk of your companies with its subsidiaries invested in there, the bulk of US foreign investment is still in uh, Europe, the bulk of investment into the US comes from Europe. If Europe collapses economically, if this experiment does not work, it'll be terrible for the US. Uh, the EU is China's largest export market. If the EU collapses, or if the EU is not able to succeed in this experiment, China's potential to transition from an export-led economy to being a consumption-led economy is, is not going to happen. 
So my, I suppose, warning is to understand the scale of the experiment that's being undertaken, to understand that the governments concerned, who we may want to have as partners on other issues, on climate change, on dealing with foreign policy crises in, in Asia or in Iran, we need to understand those policy leaders are at a moment of life or death. They will be distracted. They will always trade off and put as their priority what they're undertaking within Europe over what other governments may want them to share as priorities outside Europe, whether it be Iran, whether it be resource management, whether it be Africa. Inevitably, these leaders are going to be focused internally for the next three to four to five years, even more so than they've been in the past. Uh, and if I was advising a European government, I'd say, you better get ready for the national backlash that will come from this. You're not taking into enough account that this is going to become national politics. Look at Germany. Everyone says, oh my goodness, you know, Germany, Angela Merkel is being managed by her domestic politics. Well, yes. This is going to be domestic politics for all nations, not just Britain and Germany. If this is seen as being done over citizens' heads, it will not succeed. And so national parliaments need to be much more actively involved in supervising, in, in deciding, in understanding what is taking place in this process. The number two, I think, uh, big concern or issue that I want uh, governments to be really focused on is that if Europe can get this right, the potential upsides, both for companies that invest in Europe in the long term, uh, for the global economy as a whole, are incredibly important. So this process needs to be supported rather than tolerated. But if they get this right, Europe is already uh, the world's largest economy, if you put it together. Even if it declines 10, 20, 30 percent in relative terms, as China rises, as the US grows, it's going to remain one of the anchors of a successful global economy. So anything that other governments can do to support this process uh, should be encouraged rather than critiquing it. Governments outside need to give this time because they need to understand, I think, how important it is that this works for their own economies, not just for Europe. Uh, you know, Europe, again, has an educated population, great companies, technology, but it is run by the rule of law, it has a level of political stability and predictability you're not going to find in many other parts of the world. And therefore, I suppose my message would be, you can bet on Europe, in my opinion, in the medium to long term. But just be ready for a tough time in the next four. But if you can take that bet, you'll be helping yourselves and you'll be helping Europe as well. As we're finishing up three days of rich discussions, heated debates, and inspiring action planning, the discussions and ideas of this network weren't just heard in the hallways and in your sessions, they were also heard across the world. We had incredible media features and stories being told about some of the ideas and, and outcomes from your conversations. And I just wanted to mention a couple of figures because from last year, compared to last year, they were really uh, quite, quite significant. We doubled the stories from last year and nearly 2,000 stories from your conversations were reported in the traditional and social media. We had website traffic up our website over 50% compared to last year. And in, in the last 24 hours, we had over 2,000 tweets about your ideas, your recommendations, and some of your reflections of the last two, uh, three, day, for three days. Um, I would like now to also invite some of the members of the network to share their personal reflections on those three days, but also on how we can further the impact of this network beyond Dubai, beyond some of your individual council conversations. And first up, I'd like to invite Esther Dyson, who's uh, chairman of ED Ventures, but also part of the Entrepreneurship Council, to share some of her thoughts with us. Thank you. Uh, our council is fostering entrepreneurship, and what we are trying to do, ironically, is very similar to what we were trying to do in our council. The and successful entrepreneur is one who creates an organization that ends up delivering more value than it consumes and that will survive the departure of that founder. In the same way, our council was originally chaired by George, it's now being, George Foster, it's now being chaired by me, 
and ultimately it will be chaired by somebody else. And our goal is to create a council that will live beyond both George and me and deliver a value. Our particular value is designing a curriculum to help entrepreneurs do the same thing, to build sustainable, self-sustaining organizations, to build teams, not just a single entrepreneur, and to reach out to corporations and governments using some of the forum's capabilities to reach people, to encourage them to help create a sustaining ecosystem of training, of support by big corporations for their partners that will allow these entrepreneurs and their companies to flourish. Great, thank you, Esther. Now I'd like to invite Roger Tien, who's um, a, uh, a professor at the University of California, but also was awarded the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to share with us his thoughts. Uh, what I took from this meeting in particular was a, somewhat a synthesis of what Professor Schwab just said and the talk I heard uh, um, yesterday from Professor Sir David King. Uh, Professor Schwab mentioned that if only we can maintain four or five percent growth, there will be a doubling in our 14, 18 years. So many of the problems can be solved with that degree of growth. Professor King pointed out that much of that is, uh, will require uh, the enormous expansion of the middle class and a tremendous demand on uh, very limited resources. Now, we have heard about demands on resources. I think in the 1970s, there was this clarion call that the world was headed for tremendous crisis. In that case, people thought it was population growth uh, simply, it's not, it, we, Professor King pointed out that it's no longer raw population growth, it's the growth of the middle class, and we should be very grateful that many people will have their standard of living so much improved, and hopefully worldwide, not just in advanced countries, but he pointed out that we really don't know where we're going to come up with the necessary resources. In the previous case, what solved the problem and why we're not in the crash that we was predicted in the 1970s was that better technologies of many sorts came along. But my problem is, is that I see only one really major technology that we're still developing, which is the semiconductor software internet social network whole nexus. And that's wonderful. The problem is, is that when all you have is one hammer left, I mean, we're no longer making major exponential progress in energy, uh, in health, uh, in many other things that require manipulation of real atoms and molecules and energy as opposed to just bits in floating in cyberspace. If we don't make progress there, we are every, when you, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we keep trying to come up with solutions to these other problems by using internet social network, and that's great, but there's a limit. Uh, we're not really going to be able to cure cancer just with the internet. I'm sorry. If it were true, I've heard people say that that's the main problem in health, and health is going to be a big problem. It's simply, oh, uh, not everybody talks to everybody else. But if that were true, Steve Jobs would be alive today if it was just a matter of the internet. So this is a big problem. How do we extend it innovation to things that are not just semiconductors, internet, social networks, and so on? Uh, and can we avoid trying to put pin everything on those. Let's use it whenever we can, but let's not kid ourselves that that alone is going to be the solution to the world's problems. And we need to come up with solutions. I don't have them. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to also ask now the group maybe to share some reflections on, on the proposals that were made before, but also maybe some of the ideas you have in addition, how we can further the impact of this particular network and its potential. Oh, that, that, that many ideas, yeah. We have one over there. Um, hi, I'm uh, Zeynep Daglik, a global shaper from Istanbul. And I just wanted to comment on the fact uh, of creating these videos uh, to be shared and also underlining the fact that we have both the uh, voice of the young and the voice of the females. So I'm very, very happy that uh, young females can now uh, really share their thoughts. Great. And specifically, maybe you can highlight if you heard any thoughts here during the summit that you felt were really worth sharing beyond this group? 
Um, I think for me, um, I'm part of the Employment Council and employment is one of the key uh, issues of today. And uh, at the same time, I'm a young entrepreneur. And so I see that technology is going to be very, very important in the future. And when we're trying to plan for the medium term and uh, the future, uh, it's very difficult to foresee what the future is going to hold. Uh, so it's basically uh, what's threatening, what's uh, making us afraid is also creating a lot of opportunities. So I'm hopeful for a lot of women uh, also in the region to be able to uh, take advantage of the fast changing technology. Great, thank you very much. Are there any other comments from, from the group over there? Um, I'm Richard Muller from the Berkeley Earth Group and uh, Physics Department at Berkeley. As we double the population, as we bring up the middle class, we're also going to be doubling the world's energy use. Uh, this means we will probably double the production of carbon dioxide unless we respond to this in a thoughtful way. I personally am optimistic about technology. I believe there are both social and technological solutions and governance issues here that are the most important things in solving this problem. Uh, my, what I would recommend is uh, we need a governance way to approach energy conservation and energy efficiency. This is being done in a piecemeal way by individual companies, individual governments, but there is an enormous amount that can be gained. We could relatively easily, if we could get our world governance working in this way, save three quarters of the energy that were being expended. This means we could double and yet not use more energy. In addition for the carbon dioxide issues, there are things that are coming along. I am optimistic about technology. I believe in the energy sector there are innovations, and we don't see them only because we're in the middle of them. And we tend to see the computer revolution when we've already made substantial progress. But I believe in the energy sector, and in particular in carbon dioxide abatement, there are solutions uh, that are there, that are available, that we will be able to use, in particular uh, a a rock, remarkably new development, which is the discovery that there's an enormous amount of natural gas available around the world, and natural gas produces one-third to one-half the greenhouse emissions uh, compared to coal. So there are real opportunities here, but it, has to be, it cannot be done by individual countries. I don't believe it will be done. We have to get together as an organization, as a world, as, uh, using world governance in order to address these issues in a systematic way that will really work. Great, thank you. Any final comment maybe over there? Uh, thank you very much. Tatsuo Masto from Japan. I'm teaching in Nagoya University of Business and Commerce. And I work for the New Energy Architecture Council. We discuss a lot of things, but the roadmap to 2050 looks very scary because anything we do today doesn't lead us to a better future. So I have a concrete proposal to the great people here, young and old. Why don't we start showing by example how we should live our life today and tomorrow, being humble to nature, humble to energy use, and let show every other people this is the way we should be. Concrete proposal as of today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Jeff Lipman. I'm from the New Models of Tourism Agenda Council. The simple fact of reducing unnecessary restraints on border controls would allow people to move around to understand each other much, much better and could create millions of new jobs over the next decade. It just requires imagination and the kind of vision that we have in this gathering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe one final comment over there and then we'll wrap this up. I'm Virgilio Viana from Brazil. Uh, I'd just like to share a preoccupation with uh, the need to combine growth, as Professor Klaus uh, 
pointed out, with the need of valuing the environmental services provided by nature. Places like the Amazon or the Congo Basin forests produce a very essential uh, set of environmental services. And unless the economic system is able to price a value to this and uh, encourage conservation of these services, will not have a sustainable future. So that's, I think, a challenge for the years to come. Great, thank you very much. And as all of you know, this is not just a summit. And it's not just a three-day endeavor. It's really an ongoing process where we want to involve you in, in, in helping us bring forward ideas and recommendations in a strategic and, and structured way. And one of the things that we are doing to support you in this activity and to provide continuity is, is, is providing the digital link to, to help have these conversations and share these ideas across the world. And many of you have already been engaging in TopLink and, and sharing with us your ideas, and we hope you will continue to do so until we see each other again in a year's time in the UAE. Thank you very much.